Welcome to today's Roundtable webcast, brought to you by Century Analytics, Redis Labs, and Kubel. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director at Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, What's Ahead in Big Data and Analytics? Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the Submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, one lucky viewer today will win a $100 American Express gift card. The winner will be announced at the end of the event, so stay tuned to see if it's you. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, Paul Nelson, Innovation Lead at Century Analytics, Lena Joshi, Vice President of Product Marketing at Redis Labs, and Balaji Mohanam, Senior Product Manager at Kubel. For more information on our speakers today, you can click on the arrows next to their headshots. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Paul Nelson. Thanks, Stephen. Um, it's been really interesting to be a part of this webinar and, you know, big data and analytics. There's been so much activity recently. Um, so much has been happening. It's been, uh, especially over the last, I don't know, year or so, and this is a great opportunity for us to talk about uh, now, um, current and future trends. Um, before I do that, just a couple quick slides on who we are. We are the Content Analytics Group. We are a group within Accenture. Uh, we were formed out of uh, search technologies. We merged with Accenture in August, and our group, you know, within the larger Accenture is focused on using search engines, natural language processing, and big data uh, to deliver new insights and outcomes to customers. Inside of our group, we have four main uh, areas of expertise, unstructured content, uh, deep search engine expertise, natural language processing, and a wide variety of different applications and use cases. And then finally, using search engines on structured data for doing analysis and analytics. <coughs> So recently, we've been doing a lot of big data um, projects with customers. And in, in thinking about what we've been doing recently for our customers and what we've been seeing with our customers, uh, I would say that big data is getting real. In, it, previously, it seemed like a lot of companies were starting a big data project maybe with not even understanding the direct business outcomes, just with this knowledge or this, this belief that pulling all the data together and analyzing it would deliver some sorts of actionable business insights. But now I think big data is really getting real, and, and business owners with these you know, large big data clusters are really demanding act, act outcomes. They, they really want the output of big data to be integrated into the business. They really want it to be affecting business in a very powerful way. And that means data science is, is more than just exploration. It needs to produce actionable results. And one of the things about business is that business can't wait. Uh, if you get just your insights after a day or a week, um, that's probably too late. You, a customer is coming to you. They need some, some help. If you say, I'll get back to you in a day or I'll get back to you next week, that's impossible. So uh, everything is moving towards real time. And I think that comes from the fact <clears throat> that big data results really need to be integrated into you know, business actions. And by that, I mean you know, kiosks on the floor, the manufacturing floor, actual interactions with customers, financial transactions, distribution, uh, trucks and cars and buses. So we're seeing this, the results of these big data, everything that we've been dis discovering, needing to, to get its fingers out into the world to really help how businesses are doing things as they do it. Um, uh, and in terms of other trends that we're seeing, artificial intelligence, very hot. Um, the data itself has a lot of intelligence. They want to be able to use that intelligence. Um, systems also must be more secure. And GDPR and PII, you know, it's no longer a joke. Uh, most of the big data systems I've seen have been just big, unsecured Hadoop uh, infrastructure where you load in all the data. If you have access to the network, you've got access to everything that's no longer going to fly. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> we're seeing lots of IoT data coming into big data platforms at massive scale, and um, people 
wanting to do machine learning and generate machine learning models on those and and then pushing those models out right to the manufacturing floor to the to the camera to the microphone to the chemical analysis uh, machine to the, the 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 bus and the and to the truck um, and we're, we're getting literally thousands if not tens of tens of thousands of machine learning models that are going all over the world you know watching things and making predictions um, and just the management of thousands and tens of thousands of models is itself becoming you know all overwhelming and so we're seeing big data at scale becoming a a real thing and so I, I'm going to kind of touch on all of these in the next few slides um, obviously there's there's uh, I could probably spend several days on this subject um, and so there's a wide variety of topics I want to cover. I want to talk about single view because I think that's a great way for big data to start producing um, uh, actionable insights on a per customer, per, per business object basis. We'll talk a little bit about metadata handling, a little bit about security and what that means, uh, search with big data and why we use search engines for big data, uh, a little bit about unstructured content and how we're leveraging unstructured content a little bit more to gain insights from unstructured content. Along with that is natural language processing. And finally, some, some of the work that we're doing on model management, which is uh, really trying to make scalable tens of thousands of, of machine learning models. So uh, single view, uh, one of the things that we're discovering is a lot of people, in order to get uh, more uh, more value, more business value out of their big data machines are implementing single view systems. And the idea is that you want to get a single view of your customer, a single view of your product, a single view of your location, a single view of a, of a manufacturing line or a batch or a, um, you know, a part. And from that view, you can make actions on that item in real time. Uh, you know, in your business, and as your business does 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 business, and so what we're doing is uh, pulling data from many different business systems, where, for example, your customer may be interacting with many different business systems, and so we'll pull in data about that customer from all these business systems. Um, typically, the next step is is we just store it in this raw data space, and then start joining it together. Uh, so that you uh, take uh, fragmented data uh, from many different parts about that uh, customer, for example, and start joining it together into a more holistic view of what that customer is right at the moment. And then once you have a holistic view of the customer, we're delivering that to business applications and also delivering it to data scientists for analysis and, uh, and machine learning. <clears throat> Just to dive in a little bit deeper onto this, uh, the ingestion is typically things like copying files through an FTP server or doing uh, data analysis into raw data tables. Um, then there's a lot of joining of that data together source by source to denormalize and um, uh, for transactions and, and, and universal IDs. Uh, the final entities are these large business objects, again, with data from all these different systems joined together. There may be aggregations. Uh, data scientists will take that data and do um, machine learning. And then, of course, we like to deliver that data with a search engine to, uh, to business applications. And, you know, just to say that um, this notion of data refinement and creating a single view of these objects within the business system, I, I think, are just incredibly valuable, especially for large organizations that have been built up over time. We'll have many different business systems that talk to customers in a wide variety of different ways. But just to, to caution that the merging can be quite complex. You may need to merge by ID, merge by identifying data, merge by, you know, fuzzy data matches and so on. Um, uh, in, uh, another aspect of this is that as we get to many, many different business systems, there are going to be many, many different schemas, and so schema management becomes a, a, a real thing, and so we're seeing an evolution towards more schema-free processes where the schemas are either automatically determined or through schema-free mechanisms like JSON where the data simply flows through the system. Uh, so I just be very careful about how schemas are managed because when you have lots and lots of sources, you may have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of metadata fields, and just managing the schema becomes a, a, a very difficult process. Uh, just briefly on security, uh, Accenture has a lot of experience on big data security, creating isolated security zones. 
Uh, we're just seeing a lot more people saying, you know, our existing system is insecure. It won't satisfy PII. It won't satisfy GDPR. There's so many hacks in the world. <clears throat> and so I think systems today really have to start uh, generating security from uh, the very beginning and creating those security zones and understanding those zones and how they're laid out. So I would just, just be sure to, to, to spend extra time on, on designing the big data infrastructure and to get experts on big data security to uh, help you design the security systems from the very beginning. <clears throat> just a quick thing about search. Um, we like uh, Doug Cutting. You know, he invented Hadoop, and he also invented uh, a search engine called Lucene. Um, he's quoted often by us by, as saying, you know, that big data and search uh, really ought to belong together, and in the future, uh, everyone will wonder why we ever thought of them as two separate things. <clears throat> when you have big data, you're talking about billions of rows of records, and really it's only a search engine that can do searches and um, analytics and uh, things like histograms and descriptive statistics and uh, grouping on data sizes that are that large in just a, a, you know, a few seconds. And so lots of our customers who had previously, for example, written their results to a relational database are now starting to write their results, their analytics results and their, their single view um, entities to a search engine and then use that to deliver uh, to their business systems. Just because search can handle the volume and search can handle um, the ad hoc nature of the query. Uh, and so that, that's kind of a trend that we think is, is going to continue um, because searches are just, search engines are more scalable in that respect than, uh, than relational databases and are, are better able to handle the delivery. Relational databases are still number one, of course, for transactional processing, and that'll never go away. Uh, but for non-transactional delivery of analytics, search engines are starting to become, I think, uh, um, the preferred mechanism. And these are all examples of data that comes out of search engines. Um, so that includes, uh, you know, um, outputs uh, of a wide variety of charts and graphs. Um, and all the data that comes from those graphs actually come from search engines. They don't, don't come from uh, relational databases. Uh, and so they, you know, I, I think we feel that search engines and big data to go together. And it doesn't have to be Elasticsearch. I know I said Elasticsearch in a previous slide. It could be uh, Cloudera Search or Solar uh, or any of, of a number of other search engines. Uh, but the two, I think, uh, every big data system will have a search engine uh, in the future. Um, just to very briefly on unstructured content, we're seeing a lot more people ingesting unstructured content. Uh, we just crossed the one petabyte uh, uh, unstructured content ingestion with one of our customers uh, we, where we've unstruct, um, uh, ingested into their Hadoop platform a full petabyte of information at a rate of about 50 terabytes per day. So that was uh, you know, quite a milestone. Now what they're doing with this, of course, is a lot of entity extraction, natural language processing, entity relationships, uh, and then uh, taking these weak, weak links and extracting information about those weak links um, and, and using that to uh, identify knowledge graphs and um, uh, uh, relationships that, that they might not have seen. Uh, a lot of this in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, to find uh, new drug interactions and, and off-label uses for, for drugs um, you know, that might have come from uh, research or, or, or survey studies. <laughs> Uh, and of course, natural language is e e everywhere. We're getting lots more requests for natural language processing. And you know, I would just say, just be careful when you get to an NLP project. Chatbots seem really, really easy, and they are, but they're also fairly lightweight. And by that, I mean you may not get very much mileage from them. Um, and and so, uh, when you get into deeper natural language processing, there's you know just a large number of components that need to be put together in a very sort of careful way, so I just, um, just, just, just don't underestimate what natural language processing um, will require um, in terms of, you know, machine learning and text analysis and text processing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're available to help for that. There's a... Okay, so I'm getting down to the last couple slides. Um, this is an entirely different topic, but um, what uh, Accenture is seeing is uh, machine learning 
being used in such a wide range of different uh, locations and possibilities that um, like you're on the manufacturing floor, you have cameras, uh, you might have cameras for every manufacturing line. You might have a dozen different cameras. You may have, you know, 50 different manufacturing lines. So quickly, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of machine learning models. And those machine learning models need to be created and tested by data scientists and then delivered to all these different devices. And those devices may be doing things like, you know, watching um, like a chair that comes down a, an assembly line and looking for defects and then identifying those defects. Um, and so we're actually uh, seeing systems of, with model management where we have the big data platform that has all this IoT data. Data scientists are creating these machine learning models in their data science labs, storing those in big libraries of machine learning models. And then there's this model manager that's actually pushing those models down to the factory floor uh, where they can actually be used to create predictions in real time on the manufacturing floor to identify you know, defects or identify potentially uh, you know, either dangerous or uh, advantageous uh, behaviors. And that can actually be pushed to, to cars and trucks and uh, can be pushed out to kiosks and you know, all over the world. So this is, you know, I think, a, a really interesting direction where big data and machine learning are, are, are coming together. So just some final thoughts. You know, um, the direction of big data today, faster, more intelligent, more natural for humans, um, focus on return on investment and, and business. So I'll pass it back to Stephen, and just thanks for this time, and, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. At this point, we're going to move on to our next speaker today, Lena Joshi, Vice President of Product Marketing at Redis Labs. Thanks, Stephen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Redis Enterprise enables digital transformation in organizations. Uh, in the first part of the webinar, you, we heard a lot about sort of the larger trends in big data. And I'm going to talk a, a, do a little bit of deep dive into uh, what it means uh, to have real-time applications and, uh, and how Redis transforms these. Um, uh, just a quick introduction for those of you who have not heard of Redis. Redis is an open source, in-memory database platform supporting any high-performance operational analytics or hybrid use case. And we at Redis Labs are both the uh, sponsor of the open source and the commercial provider of Redis Enterprise technology, platform, products, and services. Now, um, in the in the first part of the uh, in the first part of the uh, webinar, we heard a little bit about sort of the traditional way that people are approaching the big data problem, where they're uh, consolidating from different data sources, putting things in a data lake, and basically waiting to gain insights from the data. And where Redis plays is really in the next generation of applications, where you're 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 trying where where you're focus more on the user and the user experience, and the idea is to provide analytics to the user in real time. Uh, so as an example here, I've used the Uber application. I'm sure everybody in the world has probably used it at some point in their lives by now. Uh, when, you're, when you're requesting a, a taxi, it's, uh, it's, you're, not just, uh, you're not just getting like all the potential rides that you could get, but also uh, different options, UberX, Carpool, etc., different time estimates, different cost estimates. So in a way, these analytics are being delivered, delivered to you, the user, in real time. Now, this is one example. Another example is uh, you're reading something on the internet, and uh, and you know the next thing is being uh, shown to you. You you read you read an article, and there's a, a set of recommendations already for you. If you read this right now, this is the next thing you should read, right? And these re these types of recommendations are being computed in real time based on your most recent behavior, so uh, it has to take into account what you just read, and also your uh, also your demographic profile, where you came to this site from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of different parameters need to be crunched and delivered in real time to to get you to this experience, which is which is great. Everybody wants to do this, the but what are the challenges associated with it? Well, the first challenge is. Most people are consuming content, interacting with your business, interacting with your application now on your mobile devices or on, the, uh, on their computers and, and over the Internet. 
And the, using the Internet already imposes some, some latency and response time restrictions. Um, studies have shown that if your application is, does not respond within 100 milliseconds, users are very quick to dismiss it as slow and unresponsive and move on. So there's a significant cliff in user experience that you experience if, uh, if, if your application is not responsive. To make your application responsive, you have to consider about 50 milliseconds for average round trip internet latency which leaves your application really only 50 milliseconds to complete the processing of, of whatever input your, your user is giving, giving it and ac including data, database access within 50 milliseconds. So typically, for these types of highly responsive, highly interactive applications, which are also then supposed to deliver analytics to users in real time, databases need to be very, very responsive. They need to respond within one millisecond. And this is where Redis comes in. Most people know Redis for its performance. Uh, it, it delivers very high performance. Uh, most people know Redis also for its data structures, which I'll talk about in a second. And a lot of people uh, know, don't know this about Redis, but Redis is extensible to pretty much uh, every data processing scenario through Redis modules. Um, just a little word on performance. Um, we benchmark Redis Enterprise's performance versus sort of other NoSQL vendors, and the, and you can safely assume that the vendors that are not on this chart, uh, such as MongoDB, etc., are way too slow to be included in the chart, is, and that's the reason why they're not there. But typically, um, people use Redis for very high-performance scenarios. The chart on the left uh, is uh, is a benchmark done with uh, that records end-to-end -end application response times and throughput. And uh, you can see Redis outperforms in terms of throughput by almost eight times with about 50% lower latencies than other databases. But one very key differentiator of Redis is that the number of resources that you need to get this level of performance is very, very small. And the chart on the right shows the number of servers needed, uh, a standard size Google Cloud Platform instance the, uh, needed to deliver a million writes per second. This benchmark was done by the Google Cloud Platform folks. And you can see Cassandra needed something like 300 servers, whereas Redis only needed two servers. So the, the key message here is you're getting all this very high performance with very, very uh, few resources needed to deliver that high performance. Uh, the next thing about Redis is that it includes a number of data structures, and the data structures simplify many, many application development scenarios so that you don't have to write lines and lines of code. The second important thing about data structures is that they come with built-in analytics. So as an example, if you use the hyperlog log data structure, it's a probabilistic estimate of of counts. Uh, and typically, you would use it for maintaining counts for anomaly detection. Uh, hyperlog log me, uh, is, is, is a simple structure where you're simply adding things and maintaining counts without needing to store the actual item that you're counting. So not only is it very, very fast, it's also very space efficient in that you don't actually need to store the item in order to count it. Another example is uh, the sorted set data structure. It is fairly unique to Redis. Uh, you would use it for things that, uh, for items that have scores associated with it. Uh, so time series data is an example. Uh, multiple bids happening in the same time, uh, where you're keeping track of uh, bid ranges, scores in a in a in a gaming scenario. Uh, range analyses in a time series data analysis scenario. Uh, this is where sorted sets really proves to be sort of the fastest uh, data structure around, all, not just because it runs in memory, but also because the operations, uh, the analytic operations such as range analysis are, are performed in memory right next to where the data is stored. So you don't have to worry about how it will perform at scale. Um, Redis also offers sets, and typically uh, people who are looking to implement fraud detection will use sets extensively and just measure the cardinality to see if uh, certain types of scenarios are happening over and over again. I'll give you a couple of examples of that later on. Uh, geospatial indexes for location-based searches and bitmaps are used for things like real-time population counting, activity monitoring, and so on. Um, now. Uh, in addition to these data structures, uh, modules uh, are add-ons that use 
uh, the Redis API to support many, many other uh, use cases and data structures at the characteristic high performance of Redis. Uh, modules can be built and used by anyone, and there are also certified Redis Enterprise modules uh, available, um, certified by Redis Labs. Uh, so mo modules include uh, processing scenarios such as search, uh, JSON document processing, machine learning model serving, uh, graph database, uh, graph query processing, and bloom filters. Um, so with this range of modules, you've now suddenly extended the range of analytics that you can perform at extremely high performance and in memory. As an example, the Redis search module uh, is, uh, is, it runs about five times faster than uh, the standard Elasticsearch uh, distro that you might be using. And typically, it is used by our customers for secondary indexing of data, not just in Redis, but from any other database for things like a real-time high-performance, simultaneous indexing and searching of catalogs, uh, and for scenarios such as text and uh, geospatial uh, searching. Now, uh, an, an example customer of someone who's using uh, these data structures for um, uh, uh, for real, implementing real-time analytics, and we did a webinar with, uh, with the Home Depot. Uh, Home Depot uh, uses Redis extensively in, in many, many scenarios. This is one of the scenarios where their omni-channel order management system, designed to process over 30,000 transactions per second, extensively uses the Redis sorted sets and geodata structures for, for not just in inventory sourcing, but also real-time available to promise calculations. And another interesting scenario for the Home Depot was um, they were trying to implement uh, real-time counts of sales per item or unique customers or unique items sold per day. And this was getting to be rather slow and difficult to consolidate across the number of relational databases that they had. And they instead, they used hyperlog log very simply and had the functionality up and running uh, very quickly. Uh, as compared to what it might have taken them. Uh, they, they actually talked about this in a webinar, and the slides contain a link to, to another webinar where they, where they spend a lot of time on the implementation. Another example of um, real-time analytics with Redis is, uh, is, a, is another customer, Simility. They also did a webinar with us, and uh, this is available on our website. Uh, the, it's a fraud detection platform. They process billions of transactions per day. Now, the uh, understanding is that the transactions must be accomplished with less than 100 millisecond latency. And not only the, do the transactions need to complete, sometimes the checking for fraud needs to happen in line as the transaction is going through. So response time requirements are very, very fast. Um, and this is where Redis comes in. Similarly, uses Redis for as the primary data store for their device recon module that scores messages uh, uh, for fraud scenarios uh, to compute unique situations using hyperlog log. You can really think of hyperlog log as a as a counter on steroids or, or distributed counting scenarios are implemented very very simply with hyperlog log. And it also uses Redis as a message broker to in ingest messages from various devices. Uh, and last example, Times Internet, another customer of ours. Uh, um, the slide isn't coming up. Uh, one second. Times Internet um, is uh, is a is a is an ad publisher, and they deliver over nine billion ad impressions on over 150 publishers. And once again, they're using Redis for smart analytics, such as hyperlog log, generating counts, real-time performance gathering about the ads, generating recommendations for the next ad that must be placed. And the key requirement, of course, is performance, and 99% of the ad placement requests are served in under 2 millisecond latencies. So just to summarize, if you're, if you're looking, at, uh, lo looking at applications um, that are uh, that are that are ripe for transformation. That are that have user experience at, at the center. That need to be interactive and high performance. You would use something uh, like Redis. Uh, it runs in memory. It has a higher throughput, lower latency than other databases, and requires the fewest resources to achieve this performance. Uh, the second piece about Redis is that. Uh, 
the, the analytic capabilities that that you would use from Redis are optimized for maximum memory efficiency. But if memory is a, is a is an expensive resource and you have large data sets on which you need to run analytics, we extend Redis to flash memory with Redis on flash technology, which cuts your infrastructure costs by over uh, 70% uh, in, in large scale scenarios. And lastly, Redis is natively multimodal, so you don't need to worry about force fitting your data to particular scenarios. Uh, there are multiple access methods with Redis, including streaming and messaging. Now, just a couple of words on as you're picking a platform that's that's ripe for the that's uh, that's ripe for uh, digital transformation, um, you should also incorporate into your thinking machine learning. Now, uh, sorry, the slide doesn't seem to be coming up. Um, Um, and and I'll quickly go through this uh, this portion. Really, m not a lot of people are uh, not a lot of people are in production machine learning, but there are a couple of challenges associated with it. Uh, when uh, when you're when you're implementing machine learning, you need to make sure that your models are accurate. Otherwise, you you end up with a scenario where people are being served the wrong articles, or uh, some uh, after reading an inspiring article, they uh, they uh, they are served something that uh, that disgusts them, and uh, in a real world example uh, of an ad serving company, uh, something like twenty thousand ads per second need to be served at fifty millisecond data data center latency, and typically they run about a thousand campaigns. Uh, now this type of scenario. Um, in this scenario, they're using random forests as an algorithm, and each forest has 15,000 trees. So you need a large amount of computing power. Now, if you look at any uh, current uh, machine learning frameworks, they, they all focus on training and creating the right models, but you also need to think about serving the models while in production. And while in production, if you're supposed to be serving something like a trillion ops per second, that would typically cost you a lot of money. So this is where, uh, once again, Redis comes with uh, built-in options, uh, machine learning model serving modules, where your machine learning models can be stored, retrieved, and updated natively. And the advantage that you gain is you can accelerate the serving and reduce the resources that you need to serve these models in production. You can keep your model as complex as possible without compromising on the complexity, and you can still reduce your costs with something like machine learning, uh, with, uh, with, our, with the Redis machine learning mo model serving module. Uh, and this is sort of a cost calculation that shows you something uh, something of a comparison because uh, Redis ML is way faster, uh, you save about 97% uh, on infrastructure costs. Um, just the last couple of words, Redis Enterprise delivers uh, significant advantages such as uh, active-active geodistribution, built-in search, and Redis on Flash, and you can read more all about it at, uh, at these additional resources that are available on our website. With that, I will hand it back over to Stephen. Thank you very much, Lena. At this point, we're going to move on to our third speaker today, Balaji Mohanam, Senior Product Manager at QBall. Thanks, Stephen. I uh, just wanted to compliment Paul and Lena for their insights into this topic. Uh, Paul uh, really summarized it very well when he said, big data needs to produce actionable results back to the business. And Lena, Lena put it succinctly, uh, insights from data can cannot wait, right? So this is why Kibol was built, uh, and uh, to just quote our CEO, founder CEO, uh, data delayed is data denied. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how uh, businesses can enable self-serviced uh, data analytics and do it now and do it at a much lower cost. Uh, so just a quick uh, introduction about uh, Kibol. So Kibol was founded by the pioneers of big data as Facebook. Ashish and Joy, who are founders, uh, they built the modern data infrastructure at uh, Facebook. And they saw the power, the transformation that Facebook went through when they built a data platform, and they wanted to provide the same capability to the other 99% of the enterprises that is not Google or Facebook. And with cloud really becoming a huge thing, uh, they saw a real good way that a uh, big data platform on cloud could provide the same capability that Google and Facebook has. So uh, Kibol is the largest uh, cloud agnostic big data as a service company. Uh, we are all on all four public clouds and backed by uh, leading investors uh, as well. <coughs> 
So data-driven companies uh, use Kubel. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, Kubel has enabled a lot of companies have the same sort of capability that Facebook or Google had. So all in all, uh, a lot of our customers, uh, all our customers put together are processing close to exabyte of data. That's uh, 1,024 petabyte. Uh, they're processing an exabyte of data every month. So that's what Kubel has enabled, and this was possible only because of a self-service data analytics platform. So the three transformations uh, that are disrupting data processing. So uh, the rest of the presentation is going to be about these three transformations and how all enterprises can leverage these transformations to enable their company to be self-service data driven. The first one is uh, data warehouse to data lake. So one of the core uh, capabilities of data warehouse is that it was a great SQL analytics uh, platform, but it had its traditional uh, limitations such as uh, it did not enable broader use cases such as machine learning and data science. And the data was not really diverse. You can only have a structured data. You will have to do a schema on write. But uh, with the different types of data sources emerging, uh, there was a need to store unstructured data and do schema on read, really. So that was not possible with Data Warehouse, which primarily enables the move to data uh, late kind of solution. The second one is the cloud uh, transformation. Uh, uh, primarily people were doing big data analytics or data warehouses on on-prem uh, with the emergence of cloud uh, solutions like AWS or Google or Azure. So there's a lot of capabilities that these private, I mean public cloud vendors put in the hands of any enterprises, right? So agility and cost efficiency became the key driver here in terms of cloud transformation. Uh, and I'll talk a little about uh, what agility and cost efficiency means uh, more in the presentation. The third one is uh, the emerging categories of use cases, like Paul talked a little bit about it, uh, Lena presented a little more about that as well. This is machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence applications. So this is beyond the capabilities of a traditional SQL data warehouse where uh, we have new set of tools like Spark, TensorFlow, Keras, and much more uh, sophisticated tools for deep learning and artificial intelligence, which are not possible with a data warehouse kind of solution, but more possible with a data lake kind of solution. And uh, cloud has really put uh, the power of these machine learning and deep learning applications in the hands of data scientists. So now they don't have to wait for a lengthy procurement process in case they have to deploy or train or test out their application. They can just simply go uh, get an X1 dot large instance type or 16X large instance type and just do the testing and get done with it and you know, release the resources. So they don't, there's no real commitment in terms of a huge capital cost or time involved in it. So this kind of, the third kind of the, the uh, application kind of application that we talked about provides a real competitive advantage for customers because they are not only thinking about optimizing the bottom line, but these applications provide them the competitive advantage to generate more and more revenues. So let's look at the first transformation here, right? Uh, data warehouse to data lake in the cloud. So the legacy data platform, everything was uh, primarily around SQL. BI or data mining was primarily around SQL whereas data lake enable more uh, machine learning as well as ELT from the traditional ETL kind of applications, as well as kind of uh, data warehouse capabilities with Hive Metastore serving as a data warehouse kind of capabilities as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So the difference between data lakes and data warehouse as we talked about is first the data type itself, semi-structured, unstructured versus structured data, and the analytics flexibility as well, like SQL versus more uh, programmatic or script-oriented or SQL-oriented in a data lake. The volume, uh, there's a huge volume of data that you can just put on your S3 buckets and not worry about the storage cost. Uh, agility, so let me focus a little bit on agility. So agility is not just about the, fa the speed with which you generate your uh, analytics or insights, but also the capability that it enables. For example, think about a situation where you need more resources. You'll have to go to your procurement team, wait for six months until they purchase a the hardware, as against just going and choosing an instance type and getting done with it and running your analytics in within a matter of two minutes. Right? And finally, the users as well. Uh, data uh, warehouse are primarily limited to the analyst and the business user, whereas the data lake has enabled data engineers, data scientists. In fact, what we see is more and more data scientists are getting on to the, are becoming first class citizens in their organizations with the data lake kind of capabilities. So this was a traditional limitation of a, uh, uh, data back office with a data warehouse centric approach where you had all these different uh, business units or personas or analysts, they're all being bottlenecked primarily by the data team. 
So for them to scale, the data team has to scale, and the data scheme, the only way that it can scale is by adding more and more human resources. But hey, we are in the age of automation, right? Uh, scaling by human resources is not the right way to scale, so you have to build a self-service platform that all these users can actually use uh, without uh, being bottlenecked by the data team. And that is what a data lake has enabled primarily where every single BUs or every single person as VC are directly interacting with the data platforms by themselves. So the second transformation is cloud computing and the data lakes itself, right? So why cloud? Why can't we do it in on-prem? So the nature of uh, the big data workloads dictates that it's, it's kind of big data and cloud is a match made in heaven, right? That's how CTO always used to put it out. So there are reasons why we say that. First one is uh, big data workloads are bursty in nature. They are very sporadic, which means there is not a continuous application that is running similar to a web application. But they are very sporadic in nature. But hey, when they come, they are very bursty, right? They require all the resources for a period of, let's say, five minutes, and all of a sudden, the resource requirements goes really down. So they are very bursty in nature, and they are ever-expanding. For example, uh, just a few years back, uh, Kibble was processing uh, 300 petabytes of data, and today we are processing an exabyte of data every month. So the rapid meteoric rise of the amount of data and ever-expanding applications determine that you will have to uh, constantly keep adding more and more resources, which is not possible in a non-prem kind of world. And finally, the rapidly evolving type of use cases. Uh, people are continuously iterating and testing and kind of deploying. So which cloud makes it enable uh, easy, more agile, because you can just go and get some uh, EC2 instances or Azure VMs or Google VMs and run your workloads, get done with it, and deploy it in production. But as in a non-prem, when the procurement team kind of figures out all the resource requirements, they're not really provisioning for a development or a testing cluster. But if this is possible within cloud, where you can just go and buy a few nodes and get done with it, get run with a credit card, and you know, kind of shut it down. Uh, as I told, uh, the three, the prescription for success are what are the key things in terms of moving successfully the cloud? First one is adaptability. Uh, you can choose any mission type for your workloads. For example, you can move from a general purpose instance to a compute-oriented instance, or you can choose a memory-oriented instance for those data science workloads. Uh, you can choose on-demand, spot, or reserved instances. So the flexibility and the choice and the adaptability, adaptability is really huge. The second one is agility. As I talked about earlier, uh, analysts and data scientists should be able to generate insights, and they should be able to generate it right now, not wait for six months and then generate those insights. As I said earlier, data de delayed is data denied, right? The third one is a cost. So there are new capabilities, new applications, uh, new personas are onto the platform, but what about cost? The IT is still worried about the cost. So cloud has really enabled a pay-as-you-go model where you don't have to pay for unutilized uh, resources and all this consumption. So this is what primarily cloud has enabled uh, in terms of agility from a data point of view, uh, decoupling compute and storage so that you can scale your storage independently of your compute or you can do the other ways as well. <coughs> so let's look at the type of workloads, right? So this is what we said about uh, bursty workloads. So this is actually the uh, actual compute used by a particular job where uh, at any given point of time, the x-axis represents the hours in time and the y-axis kind of represents the number of nodes. So these number of nodes requirement goes up and down constantly. And uh, that is what we see, where we uh, workload starts with a minimum number of nodes and then really scales up to a maximum number of nodes. And there are more workloads that come along where the maximum nodes is being pushed higher and higher. Now in a traditional IT kind of deployment, you're always provisioning for the max nodes, which means you're provisioning a 20 node cluster here. And uh, this cluster is running 24 by 7, so there is underutilization, resources are not utilized, and you're still paying for it. <coughs> Whereas in a cloud kind of world, uh, you're provisioning resources only when uh, it is actually required. So what it means here is when there are no workloads running on the cluster, the cluster is actually terminated with Kibble, so that you actually don't have to pay for those hardware instances. So you save money out of it, and that's what we call as cluster lifecycle savings. So we have seen a cost reduction of up to 90% with all Kibble customers, and 19%, 19 to 20% of that cost savings comes from this cluster lifecycle uh, savings. The second type of cost savings is workload-aware cost, uh, auto-scaling cost savings. So what I mean by that is uh, when you're provisioning the minimum number of nodes, instead of provisioning the maximum number of nodes, which is required for a workload, you actually provision it only as and when needed. So the other 20 nodes uh, we talked about, you're not really provisioning it because the workload doesn't need it. And when the workload actually needs it, you go and provision those uh, nodes through auto-scaling very easily. 
And finally, uh, the uh, spot, uh, spot instances. So Kibol has a product called Spot Shopper, where we go and get the best spot instances so that we can switch it with your on-demand instances. And we see customers saving up to 40, 15 to 45 percentage on that as well. So uh, this is essentially uh, what uh, cloud data lake and uh, data lakes, uh, data center data lakes. Uh, what it provides is because of the SaaS model, uh, customer like vendors like Kubol are able to automate it. You remember I talked about scaling through automation rather than scaling through human resources. So the key principles, the way Kubol has automated it is through cluster lifecycle management, where you can auto start and terminate your cluster. So you really don't have to. Your admin doesn't have to start a cluster. So whenever there's a workload coming, the cluster can be started automatically by the workload. And when the workload is done, it gets terminated automatically. Similarly, scaling up and down, adding more resources as well as decommissioning resources happens automatically. Performance optimization such as cluster rebalancing as well as caching your data when you're reading from S3, there's obviously performance latencies involved because S3 is a cold archive storage. So there's a lot of uh, caching mechanism that Kibola has introduced that stores your intermediate data on your local ECT nodes so that there is uh, less and less of uh, uh, delays involved. And finally, cost optimizations through spot node usage and resource substitution. Finally, the um, third revolution is the different types of application. So Kibola as a big data platform provides various machine learning capabilities like Spark machine learning, TensorFlow, as well as uh, several cognitive toolkits from Microsoft. So. The key here is uh, some of the applications, the cutting edge applications, the next gen applications that are coming like as Lena also mentioned, image recognition, speech recognition, Paul talked about NLP and text analysis and pattern recognition. So all these applications are new categories of applications that provides new insights, uh, end up being new features in the product or in some cases new products altogether by themselves. Uh, what enables them is the rapid agility with which data scientists can uh, develop these applications, test and deploy, and doing it at a low cost. The low cost here is very critical because if the cost of building these applications and going to market goes up, then the ROI strings and there is no business value proposition out of building these applications. So this is another thing that Kubol enables seamlessly. Uh, unleashing the data scientist uh, is key for this revolution. Uh, rapid iteration has to be made prob uh, possible through uh, self service access to data, cost versus performance control. You can either tune your clusters for cost or performance. And finally, for development and production. So, all the way from development to production, uh, customers should be, uh, data scientists should be able to use the same kind of resources that they want. And uh, cloud big data platforms like Kubol really make it possible. So, uh, just an overview of Kubol data service. QDS is a data service. Uh, it is built for everyone, uh, anyone who uses data. That could be engineers, DevOps, data ops, analytics, or scientists. It works the way you do. You can use uh, any multiple choice of interfaces like notebooks, BI integration like Tableau or ODBC connectors or Query Composer. It's a single platform for any use case. Uh, it's open source. Uh, Spark, Hadoop, Hive, and Presto, everything is open source. And it's uh, cloud native uh, and cloud agnostic as well. Uh, so just a little couple of uh, use cases that we wanted to talk about, uh, a couple of our customers where Kubol at uh, Sony Pictures, where they use it as a uh, kind of a single data platform that they can provide to all their customers, uh, all their users, end users. Uh, uh, this is uh, initial agreement to POC. Uh, they they fly, they, they went uh, really fast uh, in a matter of weeks or days, uh, they were able to deploy a platform as against in a matter of months and you know, years together. Um, so all these, uh, the best practices as well as uh, the stuff that I talked about, uh, our co-founders have written a book along with their colleagues from Facebook, Uber, LinkedIn, eBay, and Twitter. The uh, book is called Creating a Data Driven Enterprise with Data Ops. Uh, do download it. It's a free version. A PDF version is available. So you can download it and learn truly about how to build a, a data driven enterprise uh, at your company as well. So if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm available. Uh, <laughs> except for night, I'll, I'll respond as quick as possible. Or you can tweet us, uh, or you can learn more at kibol.com. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll now uh, pass it over to Stephen. Uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it was really great. Thank you very much, Balaji. OK, at this point, we're going to move into questions from our viewers today. And the first question is for Paul Nelson. Paul. What are the latest developments in artificial intelligence and deep learning? Oh, well, you know, it's all about TensorFlow these days um, and GPUs. So uh, we're seeing uh, hardware getting back involved. I, I swore, you know, 
uh, after the 90s and the 80s and all the special hardware machines, I'd never see hardware um, playing a role in, in the way that it is, but we're seeing a lot of GPUs uh, and the, even Amazon is creating uh, instances with GPUs that can run machine learning algorithms on them to reduce the cycle time for, uh, for machine learning. So I think the integration of hardware with TensorFlow, I think that, that's, that's massive. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, everything is based on, um, on, on training data. And I think training data, everyone's realizing, is becoming the biggest gap in machine learning is that we just don't have training data all the time. Uh, so I, th I think the other scenario that we're seeing is, is automatically generating the train da training data using weak predictive techniques. And so you might create it like a business model or, or just some rules or some patterns to match and then you extract a bunch of weak training data from that and then gradually build yourself up using that seed data to uh, to uh, build yourself up to uh, more robust training data, so so I think the use of hardware, the use of TensorFlow and, and training data, it's, it's it's a pretty interesting time, um, but all that goes together because you know TensorFlow and those deep learning techniques are going to a ton of data. Understood, Lena. Our next question is for you. Can Redis play a role in data lakes, and if so, what are the use cases? Great question, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, Redis is uh, currently used to play a role in data lakes, typically with respect to real-time analytics and reporting scenarios. So as an example, one of our customers has a ton of data stored in HBase but needs to put together a real-time interactive reporting application where tons and tons of transactions are pulled and uh, pagination times to scroll through the transactions are under three milliseconds. That's the requirement of the application. Now, this is exactly where Redis comes in, where um, you know the, the normal disk-based databases would just require too many resources to try and meet these types of response time requirements. And so, when it comes to real-time scenarios like serving uh, machine learning models or uh, 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 you know, interactive applications where uh, reporting or analytic applications where new scenarios need to be generated and presented within milliseconds. That's typically where Redis plays in, in data lakes. Understood. Thanks for clarifying, Lena. Balaji, our next question is for you. Doesn't everyone in the cloud have auto scaling? Are there any differences? Thanks, Stephen. Great question. So uh, the first thing to understand here is when AWS introduced uh, auto scaling and then other clouds introduced auto scaling, that auto scaling was primarily built for uh, stateless web applications. Right, uh, when you're running your web applications on these clouds, uh, more resources are added. Uh, this doesn't fit very well with the big data applications. So if you recall what I talked about, the nature of the big data applications, uh, they are stateful applications where the state of each uh, application is stored in that node. There is a non-uniform server load, like as I talked about earlier. Uh, they are sporadic, but when they come, they are very bursty in nature, unlike uh, web applications, which there's always a constant application load, as well as the load goes up in a constant speed. So really, the uh, auto-scaling logic that is available is not really suited for big data. Uh, big data applications, uh, the auto-scaling merely leads to be workload aware. What I mean by workload aware is, Every single workload that's running on a particular cluster has its own characteristics. It differs. Certain applications are memory heavy, certain are CPU heavy, certain are storage network, and different types of workloads. So you need to understand all those workloads, and you need to scale accordingly. This is where manually going and configuring auto scaling policies won't work out because it's just impossible for the data teams to go and understand all the workloads and figure out which workloads run on which cluster and then put in those policies and add nodes. Whereas it's much more easier when this happens in a much more automated and a seamless fashion so that the system really adapts to the type of workload that's coming in and scales up and down as required. So take for example, a data team has spent weeks and weeks figuring out uh, the characteristics of all workloads and they've put in the policies accordingly. All of a sudden, a new workload comes in, and this workload is completely different from what they have seen so far. Now, all these auto-scaling logic doesn't work with this application. So this is why uh, automated uh, and a workload-aware auto-scaling is the best for a big data application, and that is what Kibol is providing. Understood. 
Okay, Paul, back to you. The question is, how can a team of data scientists possibly manage 10,000 machine learning models? Why would this even be needed? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, as we get to more IoT and more things on the on the edge, this is this is the the world that we're headed towards where there's machine learning everywhere. Um I just read today that uh that Adobe is putting machine learning oh what was it is in um in in some connected device as well. Um uh, you know obviously data scientists that's a lot of machine learning models. Usually they create a recipe and then that recipe is applied to all devices of a certain type which process the data of a certain type. Maybe it's you're processing images on the the manufacturing floor or chemical um you know chemical readouts from a mass spectrometer or whatever, you know, that's it's so they usually do it with recipes and machine learning models and and that's where automation's required to apply these recipes to um you know thousands of devices and actually um, process the data, run the model, uh, test the accuracy of the model, test the accuracy of the the incoming data, and test that the, um, the 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 results that are coming out of the machine learning model are within you know uh, expected distributions. Uh, and so, data scientists, we do this by having them manage recipes, which are distributed across many many devices, and then we automate a lot of the process of of testing and evaluating, and do that continuous test and evaluation of models as we go along. Thanks. Understood. Thanks, Paul. Lena, our next question is for you. Do you have any examples of personalized recommendations that use uh, Redis? Sure, yeah. Uh, there are a couple of our customers that have implemented uh, personalization capabilities using Redis. Uh, while we were talking, we talked about Home Depot and Times Internet as people were using Redis for different analytic capabilities. Some other customers, uh, and they include people like Groupon, CVS, Coupons, these uh, companies, they use Redis to serve personalized coupons to customers based on their preferences, their patterns, and their, uh, their real-time behavior. Understood. Okay, our next question is for you, Balaji. Why is cloud native important for a data platform? Sure. Sure, Stephen. Uh, so there are three reasons one can think about. First one is adaptability, right? Uh, you need to be able to adapt the type of hardware on the machines or configurations uh, based on your workload. Uh, that's very key, and that's possible in cloud. For example, a uh, platform has to be cloud native to be able to adapt and change the container allocation and everything within an instance type uh, based on the type of instance that is chosen. This is not really possible on an on-prem kind of world where you don't have the flexibility to go and change a particular machine after it has already been purchased. You can just decommission it and get a new resource. The second one is agility. Uh, you need to be able to get your application deployed either in a testing environment or a production environment in minutes or uh, not in hours and not in weeks. And that is why it's very important to have a cloud native platform uh, because you can just get it deployed at the click of a button. You don't have to go through a lengthy administration process where we are rolling out all the deployment packages and everything available. You just have to do it with a single click and that's possible only with a cloud native platform. The third one is cost. Uh, if you're running Hadoop on cloud, uh, you better have a cloud native platform because if you don't have, what you end up doing is running a 24 by 7 static Hadoop cluster that stores all your data and applications, and that's just as good as running it on an on-prem uh, data center. What you really want is a true scalability. You want the ability to have a cluster auto start and termination. When you're not using the cluster, you should be able to terminate, not keep it running just because Hadoop is running and it's storing the data. So these are the primary reasons why you would want a very cloud native platform as well as integrate the uh, cost saving features like spot instances, great way to save cost, uh, auto scaling, which is really workload aware. Yeah. Understood. That is all the time we have for questions today. We apologize that we weren't able to get to all your questions, but as I stated earlier, all questions will be answered via email. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Paul Nelson, Innovation Lead at its Century Analytics. Lena Joshi, Vice President of Product Marketing at Redis Labs, and Balaji Mohanam, Senior Product Manager at QBowl.
If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived and you'll receive an email uh, tomorrow once the archive is posted. Plus, if you would like a PDF of this presentation, you can click on the resource icon at the bottom of your console. Now, as we stated earlier, just for participating in today's event, someone would win a $100 American Express gift card. And the winner today is Matt Hall. Matt, we will be in touch via email so you can claim your prize. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. We appreciate your participation. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand.